What's going on, everybody? This is Aaron Trevina, and we are back with another wonderful episode down here in the beautiful state of Texas. We are joined by Matt Moreland from Texas Vine Country. How are you doing today, Matt? Hey, Aaron. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, absolutely. I know we were able to connect the other day, and you know, it's 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 been great to to chat with you over the phone and hear a bit more about you. And uh, you know, I'm real excited for for today's episode. Yeah, likewise, it's a good connecting and, and hearing what all you're up to down there in Houston and. I'm excited to hear, uh, well, I'm excited to hear whatever, what everyone else has going on, what you got going on, and uh, share a little bit about what's happening in West Texas today. Absolutely. Let's get it. So, you know, Matt, so for those of us who aren't too familiar with you, would you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Matt Moreland. I'm in Lubbock, Texas currently, I'm a transplant from the Dallas Metroplex originally about a decade ago. Um, I'm a licensed real estate agent in West Texas with a focus on investment properties. So uh, anything from farm and ranch, industrial, retail to, um, you know, portfolios of investment properties and burrs, things like that. About five, six years ago, um, I saw a trend in the multifamily syndication market that it was getting very saturated. Uh, You can go to, we were talking about this on the phone, you can go to just about any hotel in any any city in America now on the weekend, and there's going to be a seminar on how to syndicate your first 300 unit apartment complex. And we're quickly seeing um, returns on multifamily syndications dropping pretty rapidly. And so my family and I, uh, my brother and my dad, we invest together. We just started looking and underwriting as many different niches as possible to find out, hey, where is there a gap that we could jump in and fill and you know provide a solution to a problem? Uh, that's just being overlooked. And we stumbled across the uh, grape, specifically wine grape industry, um, particularly in Texas. Currently, there's an enormous demand for wine in Texas. However, uh, most of that wine is having to be shipped in because we're simply not growing enough grapes to make it here. Um, So the majority of that wine is coming from California, Washington State, New York, and South America. Some of it's coming from South Africa, New Zealand, but a very small amount. Uh, and the, the difference between the number of acres that are producing wine grapes, which is four to 5,000 in the state, and how much is needed to produce and meet the demand um, for Texas wine is, there's about a 10,000 to 15,000 acre gap. Uh, and we saw that and we're like, why is, why is no one coming in here and, and planting all these grapes? So we started digging further and we saw that the current model in state uh, just didn't make it economical. So you might be spending um, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to plant an acre of grapes, and it doesn't take well. It takes three to five years before you start getting any fruit off of it. Uh, and at that time, the quality of the fruit in Texas might only sell for you know eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars per ton. And if you're getting two to three tons of grapes per year, it makes it very hard to to keep burning that cash long enough to turn a profit. Uh, and a lot of the farmers in Texas who were growing the grapes were cotton farmers and not vineyard operators by by training and so what we saw was an opportunity to sort of bring the right people into the right places and we we went out to california a lot met with a lot of the operators out there who you know you might have two or three people running twenty six thousand acre vineyards um, just absurd absurdly large ranches as they call them out there and we're like how are they doing this because in texas it's all done by hand and so you'll see a hand, hand harvested and hand pruned vineyard where you'll have, you know, 150 uh, workers out there with pruning shears and tying vines by hand and harvesting. At that point, by the time you pay all of them, because they're, they're getting paid 15, 20 bucks an hour, there's no, there's no profit left for the operator. In California right now, they're using, um, om- they're doing almost everything mechanically. So they can have mechanical pruning, harvesting, down to even spraying of the herbicides and fungicides to keep the plants um, clean. And what that allows you to do is uh, produce a much more consistent product. So the winemakers and the consumers of the wine, they appreciate that because they can buy the same bottle of wine from the winery every time and know it's going to taste the same. You're not going to buy a, um, you know, a St. Genevieve Cab Sauv or, you know, uh, any kind of California cab from the same winery and it tastes different every bottle. So first off, it gives you a very consistent grape. Um, second off, it reduces overhead immensely. So just being able to have one person on a tractor running several hundred acres per season with little to no help other than during harvest times and super busy times, 
that reduces overhead significantly. And oftentimes it increases the quality of the fruit as well. So our first year doing this, we didn't want to bring on investors. Uh, we wanted to have proof of concept that we knew what we were doing. We were able to make it work before we, we took anyone else's money and put it on the line with ours. Um, so just part of being a good steward of, of investors capital in this first block we did turned out so well that the fruit's actually selling for, I mean, we've had fruit selling as much as 32 to 3,500 tons or $3,500 per ton, which was previously unheard of in Texas. And it's, it's producing a significantly larger tonnage per acre. So whereas most of this stuff in Texas before people were excited if they got two or three tons, five tons was insane. Um, you know, on some of this, what's called high wire, which it uses a totally different trellising system to be mechanized. You can push 15 to 20 tons an acre and the fruit's better. Um, so it's, it's a huge game changer. And it all stemmed from just, you know, kind of seeing a, a gap in the market and figuring out why, why is this not fixed yet? What's, what's different in Texas versus California and Washington? And a lot of it is we're just in Texas, we were doing what California and Washington were doing in the 1990s and early 2000s. We just had to, to catch up a little bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, it, I guess above all, it, it takes a, an amount of, uh, you know, obviously research and, and intelligence, but also a bit of courage to kind of find, hey, I, I know there's something here. It's just a matter of, you know, like you're saying, um, doing that underwriting, doing your homework, doing your research and eventually finding, you know, where you guys are, are today. Definitely. It, it took some courage. And uh, I must say, oftentimes, especially with Mother Nature, who's the most unpredictable, it, there's some, some scary moments every year. If you see a hailstorm coming, you're checking weather bug, watching the radar every five minutes. But we took that leap of faith on the vineyard stuff, and it, it certainly turned out well. Um, I will say, uh, we definitely got stuck in analysis paralysis for several years before pulling the trigger on anything, just because, you know, the, the immensity of the numbers and the scale of, you know, having to go out and buy acreage, then going out and doing something we'd never done before, buying tractors and becoming farmers, then going and ordering grapevines, which we found out the first time we were like, okay, we're going to do this. Come to find out, okay the lead time to get the grapevine is about a year. So it's like, okay, I guess we're doing this 12 months from now. But it was definitely definitely an immense amount of underwriting. And it was not the first thing that we looked at investing in either. We, we probably underwrote hundreds, if not low thousands of different niches and, and deal types uh, before we landed on this one. But we were very intentional and careful with our time. Uh, knowing that multifamily was still a good investment vehicle and we were still investing and still are investing in multifamily, but we wanted to begin diversifying into some, some less saturated niches. Sure. Absolutely. And you know, Matt, you touched on something really interesting. There was mother nature, right? Um, as much as, you know, we would love to be able to control mother nature. Unfortunately, none of us can. And, it, you know, we can't control if a storm comes, you know, maybe a drought a hurricane, whatever that may be. Uh, maybe you as an underwriter or you bringing on investors, how do you figure that into the equation, just the unpredictability of mother nature? Yeah, that's a great question. And especially with these last three years, we've had three in a row years with 500 year weather incidents. Um, and luckily with agriculture, um, there is crop loss insurance, which we underwrite into the profile of the risk. And that's part of our presentation to the investors is, hey, in agriculture, if there's a, a loss due to weather events, um, that's underwritten into the deal. Uh, and that loss is, is covered by this insurance that we have right now. And that is, I, I cannot imagine not having insurance on an asset of this size. I think that would be, that would be devastating just to be um, cash farming it and to be completely wiped out by, like if you had a hurricane or a huge tornado or um, some huge fire, wildfire, grass fire come through and destroy everything and just have, have no way to, to pay the investors and pay to rebuild and go on the next year. Something that's nice about, about grapes specifically though, is I will say they're one of the most resilient crops. And especially with these freezes, we had um, some pretty wild freezes during the, the snowpocalypse that Texas experienced this past year. 
and the the ice actually created a protective barrier around the plants um, and all of the shoots after the ice thawed and temperatures started warming up the shoots were able to to come out healthily after that and the loss rate on the plants was for us it was sub 10 percent um, which is is phenomenal the I think I'm trying to remember what the exact number is, but below a certain temperature, the ice actually begins to protect it from the rest of the cold and acts as a, kind of an insulating layer, which is nice. But yeah, that was a very good question because you can't control, you can't control the weather. That's for sure. That's always a risk in farming. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, that I'm sure that that crop loss insurance is definitely, uh, definitely obviously very crucial. And that's interesting. I didn't know that about what was that about the um, the ice kind of having an insulating effect. Yeah. So when the fr uh, the freeze hit this past year, it was actually before the the shoots um, come out of the grapevine itself, and the shoots come out, and those are what the the grapes grow off of, you know. And those had not yet come out for the year, so there's just uh, it's basically like a wooden trunk uh, with these thick, stocky branches that come out the top, and that's where the vines come out of. That's all there was. Nothing had come out. If they had come out, they would have frozen and died. Um, but because they hadn't in the timing of the freeze, the ice actually created a, a thick, there was probably a, a third or quarter inch layer of ice around the entire plants. Um, just because it was, it was snowing sideways, with 40 mile an hour winds for days. And it created like a kind of like an insulating layer around it and protected it from when it got down to, you know, 15, 16, 17 degrees Fahrenheit. And the ice actually saved the plants. Really? Wow, I, I wouldn't have thought. Pretty crazy. Um, and there's some, some wild technology and practices in play in the vineyard industry. Um, you'll see sometimes what looks like uh, a small windmill. If you're driving through vineyards in West Texas, there's some in California as well and other areas. Like in Colorado, where there's vineyards where it gets really cold, you'll especially see them. They're giant fans and all they do is they, they spin They're you know, anywhere from eight to 20 feet off the ground and they keep the air moving just enough to create some, some uh, friction across the fruit and the plants to keep the, keep them from freezing over and, and getting damaged as much. So some of the craziest stuff I've seen and heard of, I uh, haven't seen it in person yet because it doesn't get crazy cold like this when there's fruit here. I've, I've heard of it happening in Colorado, Canada, some parts of Europe, they'll actually take giant hay bales, place them around the vineyard, and they'll get a helicopter above and light the hay bales on fire and use the, the helicopter to blow the heat from those burning hay bales to keep the vineyard from freezing and the fruits, the fruit from being destroyed, wow. which I can't imagine what that looks like. That sounds, sounds like an incredibly expensive space heater, but I'm sure it works. Yeah, now I'd imagine not only expensive, I'd imagine it takes a lot of manpower and surveillance to be able to orchestrate something like that. And you know, you mess it just a little bit, you got a, a really expensive fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ain't that the truth? You know, and it's so interesting because I know when we had talked earlier, and you know, really, you know, there are a lot of things that really spurred my interest in, you know, Texas agriculture. Obviously, Texas is such a large state, but it, it's, yeah. you know in terms of, you know, the biodiversity or just the, the different soils and topographies, different regions of the state are vastly different. So a lot of people wouldn't normally think that you would be able to grow wine in Texas. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the first thoughts that I had when I found out uh, and we started digging into this was, well, how feasible is Texas for even growing grapes? Because when I think of growing grapes, I think of Napa where, you know, it's 72 degrees year round and, it's never cold. There's no crazy winds or anything like that. Or Italy, where, you know, it's sunny, beautiful countrysides, rolling hills, babbling brooks and stuff like that. And come to find out, um, at least in West Texas, it's a little bit different in the hill country, central Texas, which we can talk about more. Uh, but West Texas is almost, almost identical to the Rhone region in France uh, and very similar to the Central Valley in California. Um, so a lot of the same grape varietals grow insanely well out here. And it's been sort of an experimentation process over the last 30, 40, 50 years for farmers out here. Um, we're not the first ones to grow grapes out here, but uh, the farmers who first started growing them out here, they were just planting all kinds of different varieties and figuring out which ones stuck. Um, so over the years, started to figure out a lot of the French grapes do phenomenal, phenomenally out here. 
And so we've stuck with those. Some of the most popular ones you'll see from Texas are Tempranillo. That's probably the most popular grape grown in the state of Texas right now. Um, Sangiovese, Grenache, Morvedra, yeah, Semillon Blanc, any of the Muscat varietals are also phenomenal and they grow really well here. Uh, and, and we're still experimenting because there's still grapes that, you know, you look around and you're like, hey, have, have we seen any of these grown in Texas? Talk to the other growers in the state. And they're like, no, we've never tried it. We never, we never put it in an order for those. Um, so a lot of, you know, sharing notes and seeing, hey, what worked over here? What worked here? And the biggest issue is because Texas is so big, like you mentioned, the bio, the biomes just, you know, across the state are immensely different. What grows well here might not grow well in Fredericksburg or Stonewall and might not grow well in East Texas and Tyler or Beaumont in Houston. I'm not sure what would grow well in Houston. It's, it's like a, a tropical environment down there. So you could probably grow just about anything, but the difference between here and central Texas one central Texas is much more beautiful and scenic. So it's really great for having tasting rooms. And when people think of Texas wine, they think of um, highway 290 and going to Fredericksburg and Kerrville and going to all the little, the German shops and going to tastings and stuff like that. Uh, when in reality, a lot of the wine is actually made in West Texas where the grapes are grown and it's shipped down there uh, where the winemakers then finish it off and serve it in their tasting rooms. And it's simply because the cost to grow grapes down there is astronomically higher. So just a, a quick example for, you know, say one vineyard, if you have one block of vines in West Texas and you have to spray it, you know, anywhere from six to 10 times per year with fungicides to keep mold growth at bay, that same rattle down in Fredericksburg, you might have to spray three or four times as many times. So the cost, you know, to have a crew getting up in tractors and going through the vine rows, spraying it, um, checking all the grapes three to four more times. Uh, so 10 times versus 40 times is significantly higher and increases the cost of those grapes to the wineries, therefore de decreasing their margin when they sell that grape in the bottle to their customers. So it just makes, it's a lot cheaper up here to grow their grapes for that reason. And also the dirt is a lot cheaper. We can still go buy an acre of dirt for, you know, three, $4,000, then go develop it. Whereas in the hill country, I'm sure you see any, as you get closer to the coast, um, especially in the hill country right now, an acre of land is insane. You could be paying, you know, 10, 20, $30,000 um, just for ag land. Yeah, and no, absolutely. And I'm sure, you know, you kind of learned that as you're working through a lot of your underwriting and, you know, kind of the trial and error and figuring out, you know, what exactly your, your niche is. And it's interesting to kind of see that distinction, you know, between a few acres near central Texas versus, you know, where they grow the grapes in, in West Texas. Yeah, yeah. And it, it gave me a whole new appreciation for for agriculture, too. And I didn't realize a lot of those vineyards down there are ornamental and it makes sense because they're beautiful for taking pictures then you go look at a, a west texas vineyard that's purely for just cranking out you know we want 10 tons of fruit per acre it's not going to be as picturesque for sure as the the vineyard out front of the tasting room but it's definitely like going behind the curtain and seeing what's happening backstage um it's been fun for me because i come from solely a, a finance and accounting background on the real estate industry and getting to be hands-on and something totally new to me. Um, and over the last shoot five, six years now, something like that, it, it's almost become the, the primary focus and uh, been very eye-opening to say the least. And it's opened my mind up to, to looking at everything completely differently because I don't know what I don't know. And this has certainly shown me that. Yeah, you know, and, and you brought us something interesting there, Matt, was it being eye opening, you know, what specifically, uh, or what was a big takeaway or, or what specifically was eye opening for you through experiencing all this these past few years? That's a great question. I have to think on that for a second to think of the most concise and helpful answer. I would say nothing is as it seems. First off, no matter how much research you do, you won't know what you're getting into until you take that leap of faith. There were so many things that even the professionals who we had on our team consulting with us were saying, oh, this is clear cut, simple X, Y, and Z. Um, then once you really get into the thick of it, you find out, 
you know, sometimes even the pros haven't done this thing because it hasn't been done yet in the state. And that's just what they, they assume based on their knowledge from taking it, doing it in other places. And so you sort of have to improvise and problem solve on the fly uh, and, you know, take risks and fail. And sometimes failure is expensive. Sometimes there's no coming back from failure. And yeah, a lot of, a lot of times, you have to be comfortable living with decisions that you make, knowing that if you make the wrong decision, there could be no coming back from it. And, and that was, that was eye opening because coming from dealing in the hundred to $2,000 real estate investments, it's like, okay, if we're playing with a 5%, 10% down payment, you can come back from this. It's similar with multifamily and larger developments, especially when you start bringing on investors. If you're a steward of someone else's capital or any, enormous amount of capital. If you mess that up, you have to understand the, the repercussions of that and, and where the responsibility lies. And it lies solely on you for being the operator on that. No, absolutely. And I mean, that can, you know, for some people that that can be a, a burden that they're obviously willing to carry, no problem. Um, some people, you know, really enjoy that and embrace that and others, you know, it can keep you up at night. So it's, um, it's interesting to kind of hear that almost kind of a, a paradigm shift that you need to have or that you had kind of before dealing with a certain type of certain types of deals versus transitioning something entirely different. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's changed the way. Cause I, I haven't stopped doing real estate investing. It's changed the way that I approach real estate deals uh, myself and with my real estate clients as well. So I had a, a, well, a deal recently where there are some issues with funding and timing of funding and had to make a decision. The clients had to make a decision. Hey, do we go ahead and pull the trigger and begin this rehab? We have equitable title of the property, but the funding is, is not cleared yet. And so I, I sort of related my stories and experiences. Hey, on some of these, these vineyards and winery deals, what's happened is, you know, financing from a bank could be 90 days out, but we might miss our deadline for the year to serve our clients that we have contracts with if we don't break ground or if we don't do X, Y, and Z in the next 13 days. Do we pony up the cash now before funding comes through from the bank so that we can fulfill those obligations and meet the expectations and get the deal done? Or do we just let everyone know, hey, we're waiting on the bank to come through. You know, we had this deal with you, but we can't help you out this year or whenever. So what we did, especially this year, is, you know, we kind of ponied up and said, hey, we're doing this either way, whether the bank comes through or not, we're, we're putting our neck on the chopping board, we said we'd be here for you. So we're going to do this and make it happen. Uh, and it works, it works in different areas of life as well. So for that real estate deal, which could go either burr or flip, they made the decision, you know, to step out and say, hey, let's go ahead and start getting this knocked out so that we can stay on schedule. Um, funding looks like it's going to come through. It's, it's an, a win, not an if. And taking that risk, even if it's, if it's um, small and not like life altering or anything like that is, is something that I probably would not have suggested or thought about necessarily before juggling everything that comes with agriculture, at least because it's seasonal. It's very seasonal. If you miss the timing window, um, you could miss out for the year. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, you know, it's interesting when you say you use the word seasonal, right? You kind of think of a lot of these, you know, uh, if you will, boom and bust industries, you know, oil and gas, um, even real estate, right? You have, you know, you have the bear market, the bull market, whatever it is. So it's interesting to hear about this aspect of the business that really a, a lot of people don't seem to know exists. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something, like you said, people don't know exists a lot of times in, in the wine industry, all the grapes are harvested in a three or four month period and they're made into wine. So some of the white wines, you know, they can be ready to go into bottle in just a few weeks or a couple months, but the red wines most often, you know, they're, they're being turned into wine and aged and flavored over the course of anywhere from nine months to sometimes multiple years. And what happens is the wineries that are making these they almost portion them out or ration them out so that they can have consistent cash flow throughout the following year when they release them, um, you know, releasing them in lots to either distributors, direct to customers through tasting rooms and wine clubs, or any other means selling them in bulk to other wineries to sell. Uh, but it's, it's not something we think about because when we go to, to HEB, we can just go to the wine section and our favorite wine is always going to be on the shelf. We're not thinking about 
hey, who knows how many cases or pallets of this are left? Because um, once it's out, it's out. Yeah. And you never know. You never know. Because when a wine pops off too, it's not going to be around for long. Yeah, you know, and, and, and it's interesting because had you said this years ago, maybe people wouldn't understand. But now that, you know, we're dealing with, you know, supply chain and actually, you know, people actually having to conceptualize and understand, hey, these, these items don't just fall out of the sky and get on the shelves, right? Yeah, and I think it's going to hit especially hard in the next 18 months. Um, we've seen significant crop losses across the state for the last three years in a row. Um, this past year was the most devastating for uh, the country. So California, with all the wildfires and smoke damage, they were having to, to cut fruit off the vine because it was so destroyed from the, the wildfire smoke. Um, in Texas, these freeze events, the rain, the crazy wind, um, a lot of fruit in the state's been destroyed and wineries can't get fruit. So not just Texas wine, but wine in general in the United States is going to be significantly more expensive in the next, I would say, year and a half to two years. Uh, and you won't see many 2021 and 2022 vintages, at least compared to, to previous years. Sure. No, and that's so interesting thinking about that. So, you know, it's interesting to see what's going to happen, I guess, in, in your industry, really these next handful of years. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to see where it goes. I feel confident that it'll continue to grow. I know wine is a luxury item for most. It's not something that that I I buy or use every day, let alone every week. Um, but historically, alcohol sales have have stayed consistent through boom and bust with the economy. Actually, they they tend to to boom when the economy is not booming. But um, specifically with wine, it's a growing demographic more and more people in, in our age range are taking up the gauntlet of, of drinking wine, whereas before it was almost exclusively the boomer generation, the baby boomers. And so the, the demand is far exceeding the capacity and the supply for, for wine globally right now. So there's a lot of risk and uh, a lot of, you know, stomach in your throat moments when we first dove in, like, hey, did we make the right decision? But I, I certainly feel like with the direction that the industry is going, we got in at the right time. And I'm, I'm happy that we did. Beautiful. I love to hear that, Matt. You know, is there anything that you haven't said thus far that you really just like to hit home for us? Yeah, I think no one should be afraid to, to take risks. Um, I think while you're young, you should, in fact, I encourage you to take more risks as long as they're not foolhardy, you know, um, take risks, but with care. Um, underwrite everything before you take a risk. Make sure you know everything that could happen going into it. And if it's a risk that makes sense for you, I say go for it and have backup plans because you know the people who succeed the most have also failed the most. And every no is or failure is one step closer to a yes and a success. So I think everyone has an opportunity to make a big splash and do something that has a large uh, impact on the world. And I think that's, that's one of our duties here on earth to, to find what we can do to make that impact. Beautiful message, Matt. I, I love to hear that. That's getting me fired up right now uh, here at, at the end of our podcast. You know, maybe someone's in your area there in the panhandle, another part of Texas, another part of the country, or maybe they just want to talk some wine and, and real estate with you. You know, where, where can we find you? Yeah, absolutely. Hit me up on LinkedIn, Matt Moreland, or add me on Facebook as well. Feel free to shoot me an email at matt at firmforge.com. That's firm as in fermentation. So F-E-R-M-F-O-R-G-E.com. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has. Talk real estate, talk wine, uh, here to talk anytime. So thank you for having me on, Aaron. I had a blast and I'm looking forward to, uh, to listening to this when it goes live. Yeah, yeah, me too. No, it's, it's been a great conversation, Matt, getting to know you a little bit. You know, hearing about, you know, a bit about your background, you taking the leap um, after doing your homework and your due diligence and being able to, to take the leap into, you know, frankly, being, being a trailblazer in this new part of the industry. I've learned a heck of a lot uh, about, about you and about, about wine and, and real estate here in Texas. And, uh, you know, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yes, sir. Thank you, Aaron. Have a good one. You too.